Search effects in Yu-Gi-Oh are kind of required for a deck to be good, as if you can't get to your combo pieces, then you can't really accomplish whatever your deck's goal is. But sometimes the only search options available for the archetype are kind of bad. And in this list, we'll go over cards kind of in that vein. And today's video was brought to you by Skillshare. And at number 10, we have Underworld Egg Clutch. This is a trap card that allows you to search out a level four or lower fish, sea serpent, or aqua type monster from your deck to your hand, but only under the conditions that one of those types of monsters was banished face up on your side of the field first. So being able to search out any of the level four or lower monsters from three different main types is pretty good, which is why this card has restrictions on its activation. Although if it was just a quick play spell card, it wouldn't be half bad since there is an entire archetype of cards called the Banny Sharks, which revolve around wind attribute sea monsters who all have effects that revolve around banishing themselves or gaining advantage from banishing. So activating Underworld Egg Clutch in the deck it was made for is not difficult, but it is slow since it's attached to a trap card. Honestly, if it wasn't a trap and instead a spell, it would be balanced enough since the deck is not good. But I guess since it can search from three different archetypes, they thought it'd be just too good if it wasn't also a trap card that had to be set for a turn before you were able to perform the search. A search which already has a condition on top of it requiring you to banish one of your own monsters. Which is such a shame that the only search card for the archetype is kind of bad, as the archetype really suffers from the fact that it's wind, as a lot of the support for sea creatures revolve around them being water attribute which really screwed that archetype over. And the only good thing that came out of it was Levier the Sea Dragon. And at number nine, we have Card of the Soul. This is a search card which allows you to add any monster from your deck to your hand, as long as that monster you search out has an attack and defense which add up to equal your current life points. So if you start at a duel, you're only gonna be able to search out monsters whose attack and defense equal 8,000, which actually makes it a searcher for Obelisk the Tormentor. Although there's very few cards which actually add up to 8,000 in attack and defense, so it's not very useful in normal Yu-Gi-Oh! Because as soon as you start losing life points, things get much harder to readily search out with it. But in Duel Links, where the starting life point value is 4,000, it is much easier to take advantage of this card. In Nephthys decks, they can search out Sacred Phoenix of Nephthys and their Ritual Monster, because both of them have attack and defense which add up to 4,000. In Tune decks, sometimes those decks will take a really garbage skill called Card Shuffle just so they can pay 300 life points during the first turn so they can activate the effect of Card of the Soul to add Tune Dark Magician from their deck to their hand, as she's the only Tune monster available in Duel Links which doesn't have summoning sickness. And then there's also Desperado Barrel Dragon. People will take a skill which increases your starting life points by 1000. That way they can use Card of the Soul in order to search out their boss monster since its attack and defense equals 5,000 exactly. So actually a pretty useful search card in Duel Links, but almost not at all useful in normal Yu-Gi-Oh, which is why it makes this list if at a low spot. And at number eight, we have Gather Your Mind. This is a spell card whose only effect is to search out another copy of it from your deck. And also it has a hard once per turn on this effect, so you can't use the next copy of Gather Your Mind to search out the last copy immediately. And then once you have the last copy of Gather Your Mind, you can't actually use it. It's just a dead card in your hand unless you return the other copies of Gather Your Mind from your graveyard to your deck. So the intended strategy of this card is to use it in decks which gain benefits whenever you activate spell cards, or to very slowly thin your deck like a lesser version of Upstart Goblin. So think decks like spell counter decks where a lot of those cards will gain spell counters every time you activate a spell card or even Sky Strikers, where they gain extra effects as soon as they have three spell cards in the graveyard. However, there are a couple of cards which do what Gather Your Mind is trying to do, but better. There's this card called Tune Table of Contents, which allows you to search out other copies of itself from the deck and doesn't have a once per turn on it. So a single Tune Table of Contents can search out the other two copies of it from the deck and allow you to activate all three spell cards in one turn. There is also Spell Power Grasp, which allows you to add a spell counter to a card on the field and then add another copy of that card from your deck to your hand. So Spell Power Grass is a straight up power crept version of Gather Your Mind, since it's better at adding spell counters to cards and also allows you to use the third copy once it's in your hand. So it's not a dead card just sitting there waiting to be discarded for some kind of card cost. And then they released a power crept version of Spell Power Grass with Spell Power Mastery 
which allows you to add even more spell counters on the field while searching more targets. Gather Your Mind is just beaten out by a random tune card, which wasn't even trying to accomplish the goals of Gather Your Mind, and also beaten out by two other spell power generators. So it's kind of useless to an extent. Although it is easy to use, it does get spell cards into the graveyard outside of spell counter decks, so that does make it better than a lot of the other cards on this list. And at number 7, we have Burfamet. This card simply has the effect that when it's normal summoned, you can add one Gazelle the King of Mythical Beasts from your deck to your hand. So, being able to search a card on a summon is good. Even if the card it searches out isn't very good, but this card is level 5 and only has 1400 attack. Which means if you normal summon this card under normal circumstances, you have to tribute summon it. And this card is kind of terrible for tribute summoning because it's so low on stats for being level 5. And the intended use of this card was to bring it out in order to search out its counterpart to be used as a fusion summon for Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast. As that card requires both Burfament and Gazelle as its two materials. And if it's destroyed, you get to special summon one of those monsters from your graveyard. So if Burfamet was simply level 4 or lower, it would be much better. Still not very good, but not terrible like it is now. It's almost a wonder why they thought its effect was going to be that strong, when it's pretty standard practice for cards to be able to search out anything from their archetype, let alone one low attack vanilla monster. However, Burfamet was introduced very early on in the game when effect monsters were still not very good, so it's kind of a product of its time. And at number 6, we have Sargasso Lighthouse. This quick play spell card has the effect to search out the field spell card, Sargasso the DD Battlefield, if it's sent to the graveyard while set on the field. Which means it can only search out its namesake as a floating effect if sent to the graveyard by destruction or one of your own card effects. Like maybe sending it there in order to activate the effect of card breaker to special summon itself. Or that would have been a good use of the card if that wouldn't have caused it to miss timing. As its floating effect is an optional win effect. So, it has to be sent to the graveyard in a very specific way in order to get that search off. However, it does have two other effects. Its search effect is only attached to its floating effect, so I guess that's not supposed to be the main use of the card anyway. As its actual activatable effect allows you to chain it in response to a spell effect that would inflict damage to you, in which case you take no damage from that effect, and then it has an effect in the graveyard where you just passively are immune to the damage of the field spell card, Sargasso the DD Battlefield. Now, what Sargasso the DD Battlefield does is each time a player performs an XC summon, they take 500 damage. And also, during each player's end phase, they take 500 damage if they control a face-up XC's monster. So, the intended use of the quick play is to chain it in response to the field spell card, causing you to take damage, and then to avoid its negative effects while it's in the graveyard. Here's the thing about the field spell card, though. It's not very good. The card is supposed to be an anti-XC's card, and not a lot of decks go into a lot of XC summon outside of Zodiac. And even against decks like Zodiac, you'd be better off running Extranet or Mystic Mine if you really wanted to counter them. Dealing 500 burn damage per summon is not that big of a deal, outside of a very specific type of burn deck. So basically, Sargasso Lighthouse is a support card to a field spell card, it's just the field spell card it supports isn't very good, and it's not very good at searching it out anyway, which is kind of funny. And at number 5, we have Worm Prince. This is a level 6 monster, which has the effect that if it destroys an opponent's monster by battle, you can add a worm monster from your deck to your hand. So, pretty standard search by destroying something effect, even if it kind of is hard to bring out at level 6. Plus, most likely we'll have to tribute summon it just like Burfamet. Although, at least Burfamet searches out on its summon and doesn't require you to destroy something by battle. Although if that's where the effect stopped, it probably wouldn't have made this list. It would just be kind of a mediocre card. But it also goes on to have a maintenance cost. Where if you do not control at least one other reptile type worm monster, this card destroys itself during the end phase. This card isn't really good enough where it warrants a maintenance cost, so it's kind of funny that it has one because it's not really a common thing amongst other worm cards. Most of the other high level worms don't have this kind of maintenance cost. They sometimes gain other effects if there's other worm monsters out, but they don't have negative effects requiring them to be out. It's also one level too low to be cheated out of the deck with the only good piece of worm support, W Nebula Meteorite, as that card allows you to reset the effects of your worms, draw cards for each one you're able to flip face down, 
and then special summon a level 7 or higher light reptile type monster from your deck. So it's not like it has a maintenance cost because it could be cheated out of the deck easily, it's really kind of random, and it has kind of a mediocre search option on top of it. But at least it has average attack for its level, so you could expect it to beat over a weak monster and actually activate the effect if you use this card for some reason. And today's video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning platform which is full of tutorials on anything you might want to become an expert in. If you've been feeling bored lately or have always wanted to start a YouTube channel but don't know where to get started, there's this really great class I always recommend to people about how to get started called Edit Videos with Free Open Source Software by Robert Reed, some of which I even use myself. And thanks to Skillshare, the first 1,000 of my subscribers who click on the link in the description will get a two-month free trial so that you can learn everything you need to know about maybe making your own YouTube channel. Personally, I'm always looking up new things, as in the YouTube scene, if you're not constantly trying to improve, then you get left behind. And I vastly prefer the videos on Skillshare to looking up random YouTube tutorials, so I'm more than happy to recommend them. And now, let's continue on to our number four spot. And at number four, we have Shock Troops of the Ice Barrier. This is a level three Ice Barrier monster, which has the effect where you can tribute this card on the field in order to select a face-up water monster in the field and destroy it. Then you get to add one Ice Barrier monster from your deck to your hand. So at first glance, this effect actually seems pretty good. It allows you to destroy a card and add a monster to your hand. That's a plus one in card advantage. However, it only works specifically on water attribute monsters. So if your opponent isn't playing any water monsters, your only target for this card is to destroy another one of your own ice barriers. In which case, you're trading two cards to add one to your hand, which is a negative one in card advantage. And water is not a popular attribute. It's not the least popular, but you can't reasonably expect to pull off this card against any deck you go against. You have to specifically know you're playing against a water deck beforehand for this card to be useful. Or play something like DNA Transplant in order to change all monsters in the field to the water attribute. I think its intended use is to be comboed with Royal Knight of the Ice Barrier, which is a card that special summons a water token to your opponent's side of the field when it's tribute summoned, which would give you a target to destroy with shock troops. However, Royal Knight of the Ice Barrier is also one of the worst Ice Barrier monsters, so that's not a very good combo to do. It's kind of just an awkward effect to have that will most likely be used on your own monsters to just activate its search. And since it's so cumbersome to use, it definitely has to make this list. And at number three, we have Symbol of Friendship. If you're able to activate this card, it essentially allows you to search out any card from your deck, which is pretty good. Although the activation requirements on it is that you can only activate this card if you drew it for your normal draw phase, and the game state is in a way where your opponent controls three or more monsters and you control no cards in the field. In which case, you get to reveal this card in your hand, then you get to activate it during your main phase one in order to add any one card from your deck to your hand. So, if you have the card in your hand during your first turn, it's a dead card and can't be used. If you draw it in a future turn and the game state is not in a way where it can be activated, it becomes a dead card in your hand and can't be activated. Although, there are ways to just top deck this card in order to forcefully activate the effect during your next turn, using something like Plague Spreader Zombie to put it from your hand back to the top of your deck. So it's not the end of the world if it's dead in your hand, but it is a problem that the card is so easy to become dead in your hand. And its activation requirements require you to kind of set it up yourself, and then you still have to wait a turn in order to use it, at a very disadvantageous game state. Although, being able to search out any card from your deck could quite possibly help you out of that situation, and if you're incredibly lucky and just happen to draw this card normally when you're behind in the game, it could help you search out whatever card you need in order to turn the duel around. I'm sure that was the intended use of this card, to kind of just be a homage to the anime where the characters very frequently draw the exact card they need in order to turn the duel around when they're in a disadvantageous game state, which this card does do a good job of replicating. It's just not very useful in any other situation. And at number two, we have Single Purchase. This card can allow you to add any one monster from your deck to your hand, but you have to banish your entire hand in order to use this card, and your hand needs to have three or more cards in it, and none of those cards can be monsters. So essentially, you need to go minus three in order to perform the search, and then it locks you out of summoning for the rest of the turn, except the monster you searched out. So at least it lets you use the monster right away, but not much else. Now, the reason this card is bad is because it requires you to go minus three for its effect, 
and specifically banish spell and trap cards, which historically don't really have floating effects when they're banished. So it's overly balanced for the search effect, which puts it in the bad territory, and just requires too many resources for what it's trying to accomplish. Although sometimes decks do really want one specific card and will pay those resources to get it. Just take a look at Left Arm Offering. It requires you to banish at least two cards from your hand in order to search out one spell card from the deck, and that card did see heavy use. But at least the card doesn't specify which kinds of cards you need to have in your hand, and is only two of them instead of three. Plus, searching out a spell card is more valuable than searching out monster cards anyway. That's what makes Left Arm Offering good, and Single Purchase kinda bad. And at number one, we have Dark Sage. This card has the effect to add any one spell card from your deck to your hand, which is pretty good. And its condition for this effect is to simply special summon it. And it could even special summon itself from the deck if its conditions are met. However, the bad thing about this card is the conditions for its summon. Where you need to have two specific monsters on your side of the field, Dark Magician and Time Wizard, and you need to activate the effect of Time Wizard and call its coin toss correctly. Where Time Wizard has the effect, where you flip a coin and then call heads or tails. If you call it correctly, you get to destroy all of your opponent's monsters. If you call it incorrectly, you destroy all of your own monsters instead, and then take damage equal to their attack. So basically, you have a 50-50 chance of resolving this card, and getting Dark Magician and Time Wizard on the field is not that difficult. They both have mountains of support that allow them to come out easier. It's entirely in the fact that it's reliant on a coin toss, because that coin toss essentially makes it, so it's possible that you can just never summon Dark Sage, even if you have the condition set up, if you're just unlucky. At least for all the other cards in this list, if you're able to set up the conditions for their effects, you at least get to perform their effects. But Dark Sage can just never come out if you're unlucky no matter how many times you set up the conditions for its summon, because you always have to call a coin toss correctly in order to bring the card out. There are ways to give you more chances at calling the coin toss correctly. There's another card called Second Coin Toss, which allows you to reflip a coin if you don't like the result. Although this card is a hard once per turn and adds one more piece that you need to get out on the board, making the combo even more complicated to pull off. And even then, that will only increase your chances to pulling off the effect to 75%. It won't guarantee that you get the coin toss correct. So, since the effect can just not work, I put Dark Sage at the top of the list. But if you're generally a pretty lucky person, and always call coin tosses correctly, then it's probably not worse than something like Single Purchase or Symbol of Friendship. All right, and that's the list. Are there any other worst search cards that I may have missed? If so, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, in addition to topics for future videos just like this one. And also, did you know only 41.5% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel?